During election campaigns, we've called on the insights of the artificial intelligence known as Polly to find out how Canadians were feeling. Now, in these highly unusual circumstances, it seemed like another good time to check in and find out what Polly's detecting out there. And to do that, there's Erin Kelly. In the nation's capital, she is the CEO of Advanced Symbolics, Inc., where Polly lives, so to speak. And Erin, it's been a long time. Good to have you back on our airwaves. How are you managing? Quite well. Thanks, Steve. How are you? Glad to hear it. Yes, we're, we're doing the show out of the attic, which is different. But anyway, we're still on the air, which is the main thing. We've had you, of course, on this program many times in the past, analyzing election-related data. What are you tracking in terms of data related to this pandemic? For the COVID pandemic, we're looking at how people are faring in terms of mental health and well-being, what their concerns are. We're looking at social distancing and people's tendencies to subvert the system or play by the rules. And we're looking at uh, shaming and whether or not shaming is effective at getting people to, to isolate at home, uh, things like that. Interesting. Okay, just before we get to that, I always feel uh, under some obligation to have you take 20 seconds to remind everybody that when you do your uh, public opinion research, you are not like a typical pollster. You do it with an artificial intelligence algorithm. Again, give us the 20 second spiel on how you do what you do. Absolutely. So Polly marries the advantages of traditional market research in that she follows a scientific methodology like we do at universities and getting representative samples of populations, but she can also get up to the minute uh, research and she can get things that traditional market research can't like geotagging, how people move through a society that of course are really relevant to this particular study. Okay, let's find out what you've learned. How are Canadians doing in terms of their morale? Actually, morale, given everything that's happening, is surprisingly high. So we're tracking morale and feelings of solidarity as being distinct from feelings of anxiety and worry. Uh, so while anxiety and worry are up, and often that will bring down morale, in this case, uh, we think because it's affecting everybody, it's not, uh, it's not particular groups, it's not particular people who feel targeted, there's a feeling that we're in it together, and so morale across the population is very high with the exception of the territories where there are big concerns about uh, hospital equipment and hospital facilities um, and a little bit lower in Quebec where the COVID infection is uh, the highest. Um, but other than that, um, morale is quite high. Even in Quebec, it's quite high. How do uh, the people in Ontario compare to other regions in the country? Very well. So uh, they're comparing well in terms of mental health and levels of anxiety. Um, yeah, so they're at around 70% of people are feeling strong feelings of solidarity and cooperativeness. And if Quebec, which does, I mean, we have empirically provable information right now that Quebec has got it worse than Ontario, worse than anywhere else actually in the country, would their morale levels be lower than the 70% you tracked in Ontario? Yes, Quebec is around 63%. So still strong given everything that's going on. Um, but definitely they're feeling that strain. Now, in terms of mental health and whether or not people are starting to feel it with all of the isolation that we are experiencing now, what, I guess, what particular metrics do you track to see how people are doing in terms of their mental health? We look at people who, uh, so the way we do is we look at how people were faring before COVID and we, we create distinct populations. So in November of 2019, what was the rate of mental health uh, problems in the population and then how did that change after January and what we found was those populations that were already healthy have continued to be healthy uh, those populations that were already experiencing some mental health problems we are seeing an increase of that a little bit and so I think that's why you see the Prime Minister bringing in things like extra funding for kids help phone it's very targeted toward groups that are already feeling it. You notice we're not seeing programs for additional programs. We're seeing funding for programs that already existed. And that's because the population as a whole so far has actually, the people who are healthy before continue to be healthy. Hmm. Yeah, the Ontario government made an announcement yesterday as well, with $12 million for more funding and more, I mean, obviously people can't get to psychiatrists right now. So for, for more virtual uh, sessions uh, and psychiatric care, that type of thing as well. So that. Your, your numbers buttress um, what the policymakers are clearly deciding these days. Can you tell whether there's a difference between how men and women are regarding the last, uh, whatever, six weeks or so? Yeah, um, 
for men and women, um, we, we were tracking it. I don't recall that it was a big difference. There were more of the differences in, in regionality that we're really tracking and, and concerned about. Um, yeah, so we are tracking uh, gender differences, but I, I, I didn't see any discernible big differences that I can speak to right now. Okay, what would be the major issues that Canadians are very worried about these days? The major issues are financial issues and uh, food supply. So I'd say those are, and obviously jobs. Um, jobs are across the population, um, but more immediately, there are a lot of concerns about, um, well, obviously financial things, how am I gonna pay the rent, but also deep concerns about food supply, which I think we need to hear more from the government. I know there's been, there's been assurances that the food supply is okay, but we're also hearing that people are hearing from other sources that it's not. And there's a considerable number of people who are hearing that. So I think that really needs to be addressed. Um, we're seeing things in the news about farmers aren't available for the harvest, um, that, that uh, suppliers are talking about concerns about the supply chain for food. So um, there's definitely a lot of anxiety about that because there's not a lot of answers in hmm. that regard. Have you done any tracking to indicate how people feel about the kids being out of school for so long? <laughs> uh, there's definitely uh, a, a lot of talk about the, the difficulties of working from home with toddlers in the background. Um, a lot of concern about homeschooling. So for the older children, um, a lot of disparity between different school boards, private schools and public schools about who is getting access to online learning. Uh, there's been some unhappiness with the philosophy that because a small percentage of the population doesn't have uh, high-speed internet at home that the majority of the population shouldn't be getting access to online resources. So there's definitely some trepidation about whether or not kids are, are getting the online learning experience and the disparities between different school boards in different regions. Hmm. And, and presumably the, the uh, I mean, there's gonna be significant lack of equity between those people who have great broadband in the big cities those people in rural Ontario or, or even further away, maybe people who don't even have iPads or computers at home uh, at all. Uh, I'm not sure how they're going to figure all this out, but you're picking up trepidation around this, eh? Oh, definitely. And there's definitely a feeling of definitely the have and have not, and also a lot of discussion about public schools are not doing as well as private schools in some areas. That's the perception, at least. Hmm. Now, we have seen, of course, the the daily briefing that both the Prime Minister and the Premier and also for a lot of big city mayors do as well. Uh, certainly uh, the Mayor of Toronto has been, um, you know, both when he was in isolation in his home and now that he's out uh, in public, um, we have these daily briefings where there are daily announcements given. And can you tell whether or not after a, a significant announcement, let's just take the uh, emergency uh, response benefit, uh, $2,000 a month or that the federal government came up with. Can you tell whether or not when that announcement happens, whether there is a definite uptick in confidence or a, an improvement in morale as a direct result of some government announcing some kind of program? Absolutely. So we've seen, and we can actually get down to which announcement and which soundbite uh, gave confidence and which things did not. Uh, we've also looked at the effects of social shaming on people's behavior, where it's effective and where it's not. Um, so, so we can tell you with, with confidence what messages get people to stay home and self-isolate and which ones don't. And if you oh, want to explore yeah, that, we can do I, that. <laughs> I sure do. Do, do tell. What's working? Okay. Okay, so we saw that in March, so extending the March break in Ontario for an extra two weeks, uh, there was not enough people taking that seriously. Definitely a feeling that March break just got extended, so my holidays extended. Um, we didn't see people self-isolating to the extent that we would have wanted to see them do that, and that's why we're seeing the numbers go up now. We have seen a, a big change in that, and um, we attribute that to the daily press briefings that Premier Ford and the Prime Minister are doing, specifically when the numbers are grim. Now, what's really interesting, I think sometimes leaders are reluctant to, to be too grim because they're worried people isolated at home will it cause anxiety. You know, this is the mental health issues that we discussed earlier. We're seeing that um, when the, the news is grim and the numbers are grim, but it's fact-based, morale stays high, but behavior changes for the better. So when Premier Ford said, we're just a few weeks from being like Italy, 
um, that had a sobering effect on the population. It didn't bring down morale, but we saw people staying at home more. When the prime minister, when somebody leaked from the federal government that we might be in this until July, we saw a big contraction of people moving around. So, but still morale stayed high. So people are appreciative of the facts. I think, um, I think the, the politicians should feel free to be more transparent. I know they've said it depends, it depends on this. Let's tell us what it depends on. It depends on people staying at home, uh, but give people that the sober truth that if they don't, we could be at this all summer, that does tend to have a positive effect. What has a less positive effect is the social shaming in some areas. Now, Quebec is very good at it. Uh, we've noticed that social shaming, Quebecers tend to be um, more conservative in their sh social shaming and who they target, but when they do, those people change their behavior. Newfoundland is also very good at it. Third place, New Brunswick. The populations that aren't having a good effect are New, uh, British Columbia, Ontario. We're not seeing that social cha shaming is working there. Um, it might be having an opposite effect. So really the best way to get the population across the country doing what you want them to do is to give them the bare facts and to be honest about how dire it is uh, we are not finding that that is affecting healthy populations. Hmm. What about when politicians reach for that lofty rhetoric? I wonder how well that does. For example, the prime minister the other day, you know, looked into the camera, made a comparison to World War II and said to this generation, you know, do your job. This is your duty. Do your duty. Their duty yeah. 75 years ago was to defeat fascism and win the war. Your duty today is to defeat this COVID virus. We heard John Tory, the mayor of Toronto, say, you know, we all gathered and worked together to help get the Raptors the win earlier this year or last year um, in the NBA. Um, you know, let's get together and let's win this one as well. Those, those appeals to loftier rhetoric, how well do they work? Very effective. Um, and also when healthcare workers say, you know, I'm, I'm doing this for you, I'm risking my life and my family's life for you, that has a huge effect on people. So we need more of that. It definitely, the lofty rhetoric is working um, because, and the way we know that it's working is we, you know, we look at the cluster analysis, but we've also looked at people's plans for Easter. So again, important to note, we're not collecting names. This is, you know, even when we look at clustering, it's nodes on a graph. Uh, in this case, Polly is looking at people who initially had said, oh, my mother's lonely, you know, justifying it to themselves. Um, loneliness is worse than a cold kind of thing. I'm going to go visit my mom. We've both been self-isolating. It'll be fine. Now changing those plans and saying, no, you know, if other people can't visit their mother, I'm not going to visit my mother either. I'll give her a call. It's my duty to stay home. So we are seeing that sense of duty um, and that sense of solidarity and that caring for healthcare workers. Uh, people want to be there to support them. There are soldiers in this. So it's definitely having a positive effect. So more of that and less of the covid -iot stuff. <laughs> yeah, covid -iot. Yeah, that, that's been, a, unfortunately, a very popular hashtag uh, when you see people gathering on beaches and, and just acting as if nothing has changed. I do wonder, though, you know, it's, it's, I guess it's fashionable to, bring, to blame teenage boys most of the time who haven't seemed to have changed their behavior enough. But, you know, in the coming... In the coming days and weeks, there are two religious groups in particular, and I think of people obviously who, who will want to celebrate Easter in the way they always have, and then the Jewish community as well will want to get together for Passover seders, and we know that there will be some religious communities. Aaron, look in the States. There are governors who are still telling people, go to church and celebrate Easter, and you know, um, what's my question here? I mean, this sounds a bit frustrating, but, but how... What what kind of appeal do you suppose would work um, if naming and shaming doesn't necessarily isn't necessarily the way to go? How would you keep people from those religious communities from gathering and breaking protocol uh, when they really shouldn't be? Well, the encouraging news is we see them doing that already. We are starting to see people saying, "I'm going to stay home at this holiday season." So that's the good news, and I think what really has turned the tide is as we said is that feeling of solidarity if other people are doing it i it's my civic duty to do this as well now not everybody is going to feel that way we have to be prepared for the fact that i mean you never have complete law you know abeyance of the law in in any in any situation that's why we have law enforcement right i mean so you're always going to get that five percent of the population that 
just does their own thing. But I, we are seeing now, I think earlier when we weren't, we weren't seeing people um, self-isolate, it was because they didn't think it was that serious. Uh, they just, the news hadn't sunk in now. Now people are seeing it. Uh, they're, they're, you know, while public shaming isn't working, they are seeing that other people are doing it who are young or who are also going to be without their family at Easter. And, you know, there's this feeling of if my neighbor's not enjoying the holiday, then why am I different? We all have to do this together. There's also the feeling we should mention that when you say it's going to go till July, there are a lot of people out of work right now um, who they want to get back to work. So if you, even if you're working from home, so there's some, some people that they can work from home, they get things done, but think about your neighbors who don't have a job right now because you're deciding that you're going to go somewhere for the, for the holiday. Um, more and more, I think people are understanding when we hear about all the people in the unemployment lines, we see people suffering that we really, we can't let this go on and on through the summer. People need to get back to work. They need to uh, recover. And so I definitely think that message is sinking in now. Gotcha. Aaron, good to see you again. Stay safe, okay? And hopefully we'll chat again soon. Thanks. Same to you, Steve. Thanks. So long. Bye. The Agenda with Steve Pakin is brought to you by the Chartered Professional Accountants of Ontario. CPA Ontario is a regulator, an educator, a thought leader, and an advocate. We protect the public. We advance our profession. We guide our CPAs. We are CPA Ontario. And by viewers like you. Thank you.